Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to Timeless Testimonies. Today, what we're going to be looking at is found in the testimony called The Nature and Influence of the Testimonies. This is the third video in a series of videos that we'll be doing going through this long testimony. The section we'll be looking at today is called Object of the Testimonies, and it begins on page 661. Now, just for a very brief introduction to the topic of this testimony, I'm going to read from page 654, and it's the opening paragraph toward the bottom of the paragraph. And um, this testimony, of course, was written by Ellen White, and here's what she says here. In the following pages are given extracts from what I have written during the last 40 years relating to my own early experience in this special work and also presenting what God has shown me concerning the nature and importance of the testimonies, the manner in which they are given, and how they should be regarded. So again, let's keep that in mind as we're looking at this section to um, see how they should be regarded. Let's keep in mind the manner in which they were given and how important they are for us. So beginning with object of the testimonies. She writes, In ancient times, God spoke to men by the mouth of prophets and apostles. In these days, he speaks to them by the testimonies of his spirit. There was never a time when God instructed his people more earnestly than he instructs them now concerning his will and the course that he would have them pursue. That's taken from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, pages 147 to 148. Now notice here, she wrote, There was never a time when God instructed his people more earnestly than he instructs them now concerning his will and the course that he would have them pursue. Now keep in mind, that was written in 1876. That was a very, very long time ago. It was over 100 years ago. And so if the time then was so important for God to give clear instruction to his people um, concerning his will and the course that he would have them pursue, how much more so the nearer we come to the close of probation, that it be for us to understand these same things. So keeping that in mind, we'll continue on. She writes, The Lord has seen fit to give me a view of the needs and errors of his people. Painful though it has been to me, I have faithfully set before the offenders their faults and the means of remedying them. Thus has the Spirit of God pronounced warnings and judgments, withholding not, however, the sweet promise of mercy. Repentant sinners have no cause to despair because they are reminded of their transgressions and warned of their danger. These very efforts in their behalf show how much God loves them and desires to save them. They have only to follow His counsel and do His will. To inherit eternal life. God sets the sins of his erring people before them, that they may behold them in all their enormity under the light of divine truth. It is then their duty to renounce them forever. If God's people would recognize his dealings with them and accept his teachings, they would find a straight path for their feet and a light to guide them through darkness and discouragement. That was taken from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, pages 14 and 15. There is a lot here in this little section. One of the things that really stood out to me is that Ellen White is setting before the people, yes, you know, the fact that they have sinned and what their faults are and all that, but not just the condemnation, she's also setting before them the means of remedying those sins and faults. That really got my attention because if we're reading through these testimonies, we should really be looking at them to find the answers 
to how we can remedy the defects in our character. Our, our purpose in going through these testimonies is not to look to see what other people are doing wrong or to just learn how bad we are and then leave it at that. It goes far beyond that. It's important for us to be able to really know ourselves and to recognize the condition we're in. But once we know that, then we can apply the remedy that I have so that we can see and have the gold and put on the white raiment and all that. So these testimonies also contain the means of remedying the sin in our characters, the sin in our lives. She says that thus has the Spirit of God pronounced warnings and judgments, withholding not, however, the sweet promise of mercy. So that is the beauty of the counsel that God gives us. It's not without hope. And she goes on to say that repentant sinners have no cause to despair because they are reminded of their transgressions and warned of their danger. Now, notice this next sentence. These very efforts in their behalf show how much God loves them and desires to save them. And again, I can't help but have my mind go to Revelation 3.19 where we're told, all those I love, God is speaking, all those I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. And I love how it's not just that God is telling us, oh, I love you and that's why I'm disciplining you or chastening you. It's not just, okay, here's, yes, I'm doing that. But no, God then says, so be earnest and repent. There is a remedy. There's a solution to the sin problem. Now, as we're going through this testimony, the title of it is called Object of the Testimonies. And another um, way of describing that, or kind of the theme in this section that I've been picking up on, is she's answering the why question. Why do we have the testimonies? Why does God give us these chastisements and these rebukes? Notice that uh, in the next sentence, she begins and she writes, they have only to follow his counsel and do his will to inherit eternal life. That's all we have to do. And that is more difficult than what it sounds on the surface just because we've become so ingrained in the habit of disobedience. But when you develop a new habit. Once it's a habit, it isn't difficult to do anymore, and that's why it's habitual. So we're told that all we have to do is to follow God's counsel and do His will. That's all we have to do to inherit eternal life. Then notice this. God sets the sins of His erring people before them. Okay, that's what He does. That, okay, why, this is the reason why, in order that they may behold them in all their enormity under the light of divine truth. It is then their duty to renounce them forever. So here's the answer to the why question. Why are we getting these rebukes? Why does God set the sins of his erring people before them? Why does he do that for us? So that we can actually see how horrible sin really is. How many times have we gone through our lives and we've done something? Maybe um, it's easiest to think of this as a child. You're doing something and you're just doing it in innocence and you don't recognize how bad it is until your parent or somebody else points it out to you, hopefully in a loving manner, and then you have the opportunity to put that action aside to stop doing it. So the reason why God gives us these testimonies is so that we can behold them in all their enormity under the light of divine truth. Because the reason why something is bad is because it works against the truth. So 
I was really appreciating that realization of how Ellen White is putting forth the object of the testimonies. Now, she goes on to say, if God's people would recognize his dealings with them and accept his teachings, okay, I want to ponder on that for just a moment, and accept his teachings, okay, they would find a straight path for their feet and a light to guide them through darkness and discouragement. We're told, thy word is a light unto my path and a lamp unto my feet. So his teachings, his word, will guide us. It's a light for us. So going on to the next paragraph, she writes, Warnings and reproofs are not given to the erring among Seventh-day Adventists because their lives are more blameworthy than are the lives of professed Christians of the nominal churches, nor because their example of their acts are worse than those of the Adventists who will not yield obedience to the claims of God's law, but because they have great light and have, by their profession, taken their position as God's special chosen people, having the law of God written in their hearts. They signify their loyalty to the God of heaven by yielding obedience to the laws of his government. They are God's representatives upon the earth. Any sin in them separates them from God and, in a special manner, dishonors his name by giving the enemies of his holy law occasion to reproach his cause and his people, whom he has called a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, that they should show forth the praises of him that hath called them out of darkness into his marvelous light. The Lord reproves and corrects the people who profess to keep his law. He points out their sins and lays open their iniquity because he wishes to separate all sin and wickedness from them that they may perfect holiness in his fear. God rebukes, reproves, and corrects them that they may be refined, sanctified, elevated, and finally exalted to his own throne. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, pages 452 and 453. Now there's a lot in this section as well. The why question comes back to mind. Why are we given these counsels and reproofs? because God wishes to separate all sin and wickedness from us. Not just make us a little bit better. Not just get us to sin a little bit less. The reality is that if we say that we love God and we keep not his commandments, we are lying and the truth is not in us. God is giving us these testimonies, these counsels, these reproofs to be taken personally so that we can see the exceeding sinfulness of sin and so that we can be separated from all sin and wickedness and so that we may perfect holiness in his fear. Now this is really, really incredible we're not used to thinking, well, most of us at least, have not been used to thinking that it is required of us to put away all sin. We have mostly thought that we just need to do as best as we can and sin less and that God will um, kind of cover up our other sins and clothe us with the righteousness of Christ. But here's the thing. When we think of Zechariah chapter 3, the high priest Joshua, he was clothed in filthy garments. And what the angel of the Lord did was he didn't cover Joshua's filthy garments with a clean garment. The garment of filthiness was removed first. 
and then he was given something clean to wear. We really need to contemplate that, contemplate these words. We have a very high calling, but we have the remedy. We have the strength given to us through the example of Christ, who tells us that we can do all things through him because he strengthens us. So we're going to continue on in this next section. She writes this. I have been looking over the testimonies given for Sabbath keepers, and I am astonished at the mercy of God and his care for his people in giving them so many warnings, pointing out their dangers, and presenting before them the exalted position which he would have them occupy. If they would keep themselves in his love and separate from the world, he would cause his special blessings to rest upon them and his light to shine round about them. Their influence for good might be felt in every branch of the work and in every part of the gospel field. But if they fail to meet the mind of God, if they continue to have so little sense of the exalted character of the work as they have had in the past, their influence and example will prove a terrible curse. They will do harm and only harm. The blood of precious souls will be found upon their garments. Testimonies of warning have been repeated. I inquire, who have heeded them? Who have been zealous in repenting of their sins and idolatry? and have been earnestly pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I have waited anxiously, hoping that God would put his spirit upon some and use them as instruments of righteousness to awaken and set in order his church. I have almost despaired as I have seen, year after year, a greater departure from that simplicity which God has shown me should characterize the life of his followers. There has been less and less interest in and devotion to the cause of God. I ask, wherein have those who profess confidence in the testimonies sought to live according to the light given in them? Wherein have they regarded the warnings given? Wherein have they heeded the instructions they have received. That was taken from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, page 483 and 484. Now this is wrapping up this section of the testimony, and you can hear the pleading in Ellen White's writings as she's asking, who has heeded these things? Who has taken this seriously? Who has allowed this? to change them? Who has been earnestly pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus? It is a high calling. It's an exalted work. I just want to leave you with one thought here. It's taken from Proverbs. Um, and it's in chapter 1, verses 7 to 9. And here's what it says. Fearing the Lord is the beginning of moral knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Listen, my child, to the instruction from your father, and do not forsake the teaching from your mother, for they will be like an elegant garland on your head and like pendants around your neck. I sure hope that this has been a blessing for you. And as we continue to investigate the testimonies for the church, we want to be willing to be self-examining and asking if we are doing the same things that others have been reproved for. And if we have, remember we're told that we can then take that testimony as having been written, especially for us. And then we have the opportunity to repent and to turn away from the sin that we have been committing and to accept the life that God is so freely offering 
and to have our garments of iniquity removed so that we can be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Blessings to you all and shalom. Mm -hmm.